My name is Jada Elcock. I am an incoming University of Washington graduate student in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, and I'm obsessed with animals, <laughs> obviously. So I will give a little bit more about who I am. Again, my name is Jada. I love the ocean. I've always loved the ocean. I think that it is a beautiful place and it's full of so many wacky, weird, crazy, cool animals. Um, for those of you that are curious, because I'm, I know I'm going to get this question at some point, that orange thing I'm holding in the picture all the way to the right is actually two sea anemones attached to a glass bottle that we pulled up in a trawl net. So, and I, I had to take a picture with it because it's goopy and weird and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and so then you can see me, a picture of me bending down, um, going through all this seaweed. And that was like a sane. So we pulled in all this water and a bunch of seaweed and a ton of fish. And we had to go through all the seaweed and try and get as much fish out as possible so that we could do, um, you know, studies on them. We could do like, like biomechanic experiments on them and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, my specialty is sharks. I think that they are wonderful. Um, they are unique in that they have cartilaginous skeletons instead of bony skeletons. And that's really cool. And they've been around for longer than you could possibly imagine about 450 million years, which is older than trees, crazy enough. Um, yeah, I think sharks are amazing, which is why I have a shark mask in that picture of me with the hard hat on. All of the masks that I have for this pandemic have sharks on them because it seems very fitting. Um, and I also did uh, an internship at an aquarium called Odyssey Aquarium in Arizona, actually, because I grew up in landlocked states. I didn't really have access to the ocean. So my best way to get experience was to go through um, an aquarium and do an internship through that. So. If any of you have the chance to do that in the future, maybe you're in landlocked states, if that's an option for you. I had a ton of fun with it. I got to, you know, as you can see there in this picture at the bottom, I was feeding the animals. Um, we got to take care of them and clean their exhibits and tell people all about them and how cool they are. So that was an awesome experience. Um, growing up in Illinois and Arizona, my brothers and I, our favorite thing to do is just go outside, see what cool animals we could find, watch them live their lives. Birds, turtles, snakes, scorpions, spiders, toads, really anything we could find just because we liked interacting with animals and seeing what their lives were like. Um, you'd think that growing up in landlocked states that maybe that would, I guess, deter me from pursuing a career in marine sciences, but since that was an ecosystem I didn't have access to yet, I just wanted to learn as much about it as I possibly could. So uh, the more I learned through TV shows and documentaries, the more interested I became. And my passion for shark sciences started in high school when I realized that these animals are so incredibly misunderstood and we have so much more to learn about them. So I figured if there was one group of animals that needed my help more than others, it would be sharks. So I decided that shark research was my career path. It's what I want to do with my life. And I can't wait to get started. I know people that do marine science at Arizona State University in the middle of the desert. You know, as long as you, it depends on what work you're doing. Um, but if you're doing, you know, ecology work and you want to go out into the field and, you know, get experience with some of these animals, you can go to a tropical place. Like you can go study corals and beautiful mm -hmm. tropical fishes out in, uh, like the Caribbean, something like that. Um, you can go to the Arctic where the Greenland shark lives and study animals in these super, super cold environments, which would be, you would think very, very different from the animals that live in the tropical environments. Then there's very in between kind of thing. You can go uh, to like a temperate environment. I think that's that's kind of like the water around where I live in Washington. Um, it's temperate, so it's not super super like Arctic cold, but it's definitely not warm. And so there's a whole another kind of ecosystem that's happening there. Um, but you can also you know go to estuaries where you know rivers and the oceans meet. You can like you guys said earlier, you can study it in a lab. You can use, you can do it on a computer. I've done things on a computer looking at like CT scans um, of fish bones and trying to segment out certain bones and see what they look like and measure them. You can do all of that from a computer. And I've done them from home while, while I was quarantined back in Arizona. So there are tons of opportunities. You can do them in a lot of different places. Um, 
and it will all your daily life as a marine scientist will look very different depending on what you study and how you study. I am a co-founder of MISS. I am also the director of public relations at MISS and I'm a graduate student at the University of Washington in the School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, and I'm working towards a PhD. I wanna work in shark conservation because I wanna help make a difference. There are so many different endangered shark species out there, and for a lot of them, we don't know much about movement ecology, habitat use, and that makes it incredibly difficult to make management decisions that will actually help protect them. Why do we need to protect them? Because they are essential pieces of our ocean's food webs. Some are mid-level predators, some are top predators, some are keystone species, and all of them are super important to maintain the health of our ocean ecosystem. So, that's why I study sharks, and that's why everyone should study sharks. Um, my main thing for getting through these obstacles is um, kind of like what Carly said, you know, like proving the haters wrong. I am too stubborn to allow someone to tell me what I am and am not capable of. And people are like, are you sure? Like, that seems really hard. Maybe you should pick a plan B or maybe you should try for something else. Maybe you should do this. And I'm like, no, why would I do that? Because this is what I want to do. So I'm going to make it happen. Right. Um, and Definitely, I think, you know, self-love is a huge thing. I know everybody has imposter syndrome. Believe it or not, you are not the only person with imposter syndrome. That needs to be said. Everyone thinks they're the only one, and that's not true. So um, be your own hype man and find your friends that will be your hype men, because that's an important thing to be able to be like, you get through an R code like I did earlier. I was working on it for an hour and a half. I finally fixed the one bug that I had and I was like, you know what? Good for you, girl. You're smart. That was awesome. I'm so proud of myself. Like that is totally okay to do. Um, I might sound a little conceited sometimes when I do that, but it is all out of self love and trying to, you know, like pump yourself up um, to like get through the hard moments. Cause there are hard moments in every day um, and in science and as a minority and a woman in science and you have to find the people that are going to pump you up and you got to pump yourself up and just don't let people tell you what you are and are not capable of. Because if you if, if you want to do it, you can do it. And you can make it happen for yourself. You just have to get through the obstacles, which it sucks sometimes, but you can absolutely do it. By visiting our website. For those of you that are joining the field, here's what I got for you. Network like crazy, because all these connections are going to be super, super helpful along the way. Be yourself and believe in yourself because you worked hard to get here. You absolutely belong here. Don't forget to have fun. Super important message there. And welcome to the field. We're excited to have you. Animal facts. Who's this guy? A Greenland shark. Do you see this little doohickey on his eyeball? This is a parasitic copepod. This is why Greenland sharks are blind. Basically, these copepods eat at their eyeballs, and uh, yeah, so they're blind. Greenland sharks are thought to be the oldest living vertebrate species on the planet. I think the oldest one found was like 200, almost 300 years old, question mark? Old, old boys. Ah, uh, I looked it up. 512 years. Well, I was wrong. And that is okay. He live in the Arctic, a old man ice boy. The cold is a hardship, but he's a very nice boy. They're also very slow. They can only move at max like two miles per hour. You try running as fast as you can in the frigid cold. He can also get to almost 16 feet long. A big guy. What animal should I do next? Hey there friends, I'm back Marine Facts to talk about the bear live fish. I'm by the ocean today, so of course I had to pick an ocean animal. These dudes are about six inches long and they live in the Pacific Ocean. They live in the Mesopelagic, aka the Twilight Zone, which is between 2,000 and 2,600 feet deep. But I know what y'all want to talk about, so let's get right to the point. The head is transparent and the eyes are located within the transparent dome. The type of eyes they have are called tubular eyes. <laughs> tubular, bro. Those little black dots above the mouth are actually the nostrils. But they look so much like eyes that it's hard for me to look at the fish and then see the eyes as the eyes. Does that make sense? It just looks like it has an itty bitty face right at the front of its head. But snaps revolution because this transparent head was a great idea. It allows tons of light to enter these gigantic eyeballs, which is super important in the Twilight Zone where light is very 
very limited. It also allows these giant green eyeballs to rotate every which way from Tuesday. People still use that saying, right? Now, usually the eyes are facing straight upwards, looking through its own head to find food. Imagine being able to roll your eyes into the back of your head and still be able to see the sky. What an uncomfortable thought. But when it does find food, it can rotate its eyes forward to make sure that it actually gets food into its mouth. Something I find funny is they're known to steal food from siphonophores. And their itty bitty baby mouths give them the precision to do so carefully. They're like the bullies at school stealing lunch money from helpless children. But the siphonophores zap zap sting sting right back. It's a good thing they got that big old dome to protect those beautiful, important green orbs. I think we found the world's largest forehead, and it's not mine. Hey there, friends, I'm back. More real facts to talk about chimeras. Not the dragon lion goat snake monster, but this dude, the ratfish. Look at his little rat tail. There are many different species of chimeras, so they come in a range of different sizes and shapes. They also vary in color, but they're all beautiful. They tend to live in temperate to cold waters around the world's oceans. They're also found pretty dang deep, around 8,200 feet. These dudes are closely related to sharks and are sometimes even called ghost sharks. Ghost shark. They happen to be in the same class, chondrichthys. So yes, they have a skeleton made of cartilage. But while sharks are in the subclass Elasmobranchii, these guys are in the subclass Holocephali. Sharks typically have five gill slits, but these guys have four. And those gill slits are covered by a fleshy opercle, so it looks like they only have one gill opening. The deception. You may also notice he's got a very skinny tail. That's because they don't use their tails to propel them forward like sharks do. They use their pectoral fins. You are precious deep sea butterfly. You see how this dude has lines all over his face? They kind of look like tough guy scars, which is hilarious because they're so small and cute. But they're actually sensory organs! And they use these organs to detect the electric field of potential prey items, which is arguably way cooler than a tough guy scar. Something else I find funny is a lot of them don't have skeletal structures in their noses, so it's just kind of like a squishy, adorable blob. He's so boopable. The resemblance is uncanny. Hey there, friends, I'm back. More animal facts talk about the Vinterong. They look like a cross between a bear and a cat, which is funny because they're also commonly known as the bear cat. But honestly, they're not that closely related to the bear or the cat, so do with that information what you will. These dudes can be nearly three feet long from head to booty and up to 71 pounds. Them thick boys. They spend most of their time in the trees of the rainforests of Southeast Asia. And they've got some weird adaptations for climbing. Chillin' ain't one of them, but it's a mood. They've got padded paws and sharp claws to help them grip branches. But the crazy thing is they can rotate their ankles 180 degrees to face backwards. That way, when they're climbing down a tree head first, they still got a solid grip. Every time a person says they're double-jointed, the bear cat rolls its eyes. They've also got partially prehensile tails. The tail cannot support the entire body weight of an adult, but it's better than nothing. I mean, I can barely do a pull-up, so I imagine that tail is really helpful. Oh my god, it's so cute. They may be in the order carnivora, but they're not technically carnivores. Oh, it's a deception. They're actually generalist omnivores that eat whatever they can find. They prefer to eat fruit, but they'll also eat veggies and small animals. And because they eat so much fruit, they're important for seed dispersal. I guess their poop is pretty important for plant production. Please admire this baby. The funniest thing about the bear cat is they smell like popcorn. There's a chemical in their urine that makes them smell that way. Wow, they really put the pee in popcorn. Hey there, friends, I'm back. More real facts to talk about pufferfish. There are over 120 species of puffer pals. Of course, we know that some live in the ocean, but did you know that some live in freshwater? And they come in a variety of different sizes between one inch and three feet long. Gotta appreciate that range. I gotta tell you how smart they are. These fish and many others can actually be trained to eat from a target. Peak intelligence. Fish genus. More like fish genius. But what do they eat? The big boys use their beaks to crack open clams and shellfish. Crack a snack and throw the shell back. <laughs> but the smaller guys tend to go after other inverts and algae. Hey chef, can I get a Caesar salad? I'm sorry for that joke. Gotta quickly acknowledge how cute this is. So we know that most of these dudes are poisonous. Yes, poison, not venom. The difference is that venom is injected by bite or sting. But poison is ingested or absorbed through the skin. Neither are a great situation. <laughs> but how are they poisonous? It's believed they make their toxins using the bacteria and the animals that they eat. And they don't have scales, just rough spiky skin. So when a predator tries to eat a deflated pufferfish, they gon' get a spicy surprise. And also probably death. Weirdly enough though, you can eat a pufferfish, but only if it's prepared by a licensed professional. But if it's made wrong, it'll be a bad day, and quite possibly your last. Yikes. I personally would argue that it's not worth the risk, but to each their own. Hey there friends, I'm back with more facts to talk about the King Cobra. These cats are big boys getting up to 20 pounds and 18 feet long. They happen to be the longest of all venomous snakes, so yeah, the king. Unfortunately, they're vulnerable to extinction due to overexploitation and habitat destruction. So say it with me, conservation is important. Good. Their venom is not the most potent of all venomous snakes, but one bite is enough to potentially take down an elephant, so... Honestly, it's probably better for everyone if we just stayed away and lived our separate lives. But don't worry because they're apparently pretty shy and tend to avoid humans anyway. They'd much rather be out in the plains, forests, and mangroves of India, China, and Southeast Asia minding their own business. And the cool thing is because they live in so many different regions and a bunch of different habitats, their coloration can vary. They're all equally beautiful in my opinion. <laughs> they're out in the wild looking for prey like other snakes, both venomous and non-venomous. But they also snack on lizards, eggs, and small mammals. Such beautiful royalty deserves variety, am I right? But now here's a fun tidbit, you've been lied to. He may be the king, but he ain't no cobra. Now there's still some debate on this between scientists, but here's the deal. True cobras are in the genus Naha. Naja? I don't know, I don't speak Latin. But the king cobra is the only member of the genus Ophio. Phages. They're actually thought to be more closely related to mambas than true cobras. I don't know about y'all, but considering this guy's long enough to lift a third of his body off the ground and look into my eyes and my soul, I'm gonna let him keep his cobra crown. Hey there, friends, I'm back. More animal facts to talk about the giant stag beetle. Oh, there's one. Is it just me or do they look like a crab arm sprouted legs? There are many different species of stag beetle, but the giant stag beetle is the largest in North America. They can get to be over two inches long, and it's important to mention that they can be either red or black. 
I like the red ones. They rely on damp dead wood so you can find them in mature forests. They actually prefer lowland forests for breeding, so don't go looking for them on a mountainside. They use the wood as a baby beetle nursery. They lay their eggs in the logs. The larvae can thrive here for quite a long time before they turn into the big honking beetle boys that we all know and hopefully love. Quite honestly, I prefer the beetle form over the larva form, but we all gotta start somewhere, right? Now, I know y'all wanna talk about the crazy face, so here's the deal. Yes, they've got giant jaws, but the gag is only the males do. See what I mean? The females have small mandibles, but the males have massive manly mandibles. The males have giant jaws so they can duel for the hand of a lady. So yeah, it's basically for mating competition. Kinda like deers with their antlers. Long live the king can they bite i find this question to be quite strange because really anything with a mouth or jaws can bite you so yes they can pinch you but they'll probably leave you alone as long as you don't bug them see what i did there and i felt the need to tell you they can fly so if you don't like flying insects have fun with a two inch long flying beetle with antlers on its face personally i think it's kind of cute hey there friends I'm back more on facts talk about the mahi mahi they're also known as the dolphin fish but i don't exactly know why but what i do know is even though they're fished heavily their populations are stable fisheries can be sustainable and we love to see it they're also gorgeous i mean look at those colors it's like this fish was mother nature's art project and of course they live in the tropics like every other beautiful fish and i want to go there so bad does someone want to volunteer to take me diving in the tropics please but they're not just colorful they have color changing cells called chromatophores allowing them to really shine bright like a diamond these pretty fish are pelagic predators eating small fish and squids apparently they're also known for catching flying fish impressive you basketball players better watch your back my man's got mad hops <laughs> problem is they're not top predators so they can be eaten by large billfish and sharks i love shark they're like freshmen in high school where you think you're top dog but you're definitely not top dog. That doesn't mean they're small. They can grow to nearly seven feet long and almost 90 pounds. They only live to be like five, so that's impressive. And they grow very fast. They actually hit sexual maturity in just a few months, going from microscopic to about a foot and a half long in that short time. Can you imagine growing a foot and a half in three months? And I thought it was hard to buy clothes in middle school. My spine hurts just thinking about it. Those growing pains sound rough. A beautiful, fast-growing mid-level predator. Mahi Mahi's the best. No one does the job better, er. Hey there friends, I'm back more on facts to talk about the green anaconda. I met a green anaconda once. Her name was Green Bean. These dudes can be found in the Amazon and Orinoco River basins in South America. They're also the world's largest snake getting to be 30 feet long. You ever been in a school bus? It's like that, but alive. Lots of different kind of jolly green giant. But I guess you have to be that big if you're gonna give birth to 36 two foot long, fully functioning babies. That seems like a lot of work. It can also be up to 550 pounds and over a foot in diameter. And it's measured an eye too in a foot in diameter. <laughs> They're in the boa family, so they use this mass to constrict their giant prey. You've heard of the kiss of life, but these guys give a hug of death. They squeeze the literal life out of their prey. They tend to go after things like birds, deer, pigs, capybaras, and even caimans and jaguars. Of course, they've got those stretchy snake jaws to swallow their prey whole. Meanwhile, I take too big a bite of a sandwich and it feels like my esophagus is going to explode. Did you know these guys are considered to be semi-aquatic? They can be found on land as well as marshes and swamps. The problem is they're not so great on land because, you know, they're like 500 plus pounds, but they're stealth masters in the water. As you can see, their eyes and nostrils sit at the top of their head. That allows them to be almost fully submerged like this and sneak up on their prey. It's like a deadly game of Where's Waldo? The anaconda ain't real fast. He uses stealth to get snacks. Hey there friends, I'm back. Mario Facts talk about the manatee. Let's start by saying I wish I was a manatee. All they do is float and eat. I love it. They live in the quarantine dream, baby. As an American, I'm used to thinking about manatees in the shallow coastlines and rivers of Florida. Though it makes no sense to me, that's the West Indian manatee. There are two other species. The West African manatee that lives on the coast of Western Africa, and the Amazonian manatee that lives in the Amazon. Only two out of three are accurately named, and that really bothers me. <laughs> These guys need warm water, like a nice salty bath. Because believe it or not, they don't have enough fat to keep them warm in cold water. They're as big as they are because they have giant stomachs and intestines. <laughs> but we gotta stay warm, and Florida, Africa, and South America seem like the greatest place to be for that. Let's talk about that tongue, because I bet it comes with a huge appetite. They eat for about half the day, same. And they can eat up to 10% of their body weight and vegetation every single day. They can get to be up to 1,200 pounds. That's over 100 pounds of food a day. That's a lot of salad. That'd be like me eating 14 pounds of food a day. Give me enough pasta and I'm gonna give it a try. My favorite fact about these guys? The closest living relative is not a whale nor a walrus. No, it is an elephant. That's right. They shared a terrestrial ancestor with elephants way back when. So manatees are just aquatic elephants with short noses. <laughs> oh, when you know all those sailor stories about mermaids, chances are it was just a thick manatee with good lighting. Hey there, friends, I'm back. More class talk about the honey badger. They can be about three feet long, a foot tall, and about 30 pounds. Merry thick, miss, little chonk. <laughs> These dudes are part of the weasel family. They're related to ferrets, other badgers, and weasels, obviously. They're native to mainly dry, but sometimes forested areas of Asia and Africa. And they're apparently great swimmers and good at climbing trees. Do you think they're friends with the Lorax? However, they do spend a lot of time underground in their nine foot long and five foot deep burrows. We've all heard the phrase, honey badger don't care. So just know he'll steal a burrow from a fox, mongoose, or hare. Bars. These guys are typically solitary, but sometimes they meet up in their favorite foraging places. How do they know when to meet? Do you think they have a group chat? Call the group chat badger honeys. Just kidding, they roll around on the ground for scent marking purposes. And they'll eat almost anything because again, honey badger don't care. I do, I care, I'm a very picky eater. <laughs> they'll eat mammals, birds, insects, reptiles, you name it. <laughs> they'll even eat decaying flesh. And they'll wash it down with a couple of fruits and veggies. But that doesn't change the fact that you just ate your rotting neighbor, my guy. Now the cool thing about these guys is that their skin is so thick that bee stings, dog bites, and even porcupine pokers do essentially nothing. It's believed that they're also resistant to snake venom. Evolution did a stellar job with these tiny monsters. Finding something that bothers him is incredibly rare because my man the honey badger just don't try Hey there friends, I'm back. Mario facts talk about the coastal tailed frog. Look how cute they are with their little eye striping little triangle nose. The coloration helps them blend in with the rocks that they live by. Cute and cryptic. I guess you could say that rocks. I will not apologize for that terrible joke. And these little guys live out here in Washington, so we're basically neighbors. They live in the US. Their closest living relatives actually live in New Zealand. That's quite far.
and they're considered to be one of the most primitive frogs. They're also one of the longest living frog species, living to be 15 to 20 years old. My favorite thing about them is that they spend a lot of time underwater. I'm jealous. I wish I was underwater literally right now. But because of that, they got a lot of cool adaptations for aquatic life. Like hardened claw like thingies. Some frogs have sticky hands, but these guys have talon toes to help them grip rocks underwater. They also have itty bitty reduced lungs to help with buoyancy control. But they mostly breathe through their skin. That's weird. Like, what are you, an insect? No shade, entomologist, y'all are cool. <laughs> What's arguably even weirder is they have tails. Or do they? You see, that organ's not actually a tail, and if you see it on a frog, that frog is a male. Because that's actually a reproductive organ. I'm gonna keep calling it a tail because that's way less uncomfortable. And this <clears throat> tail helps with internal fertilization, making them one of the only frog species to use internal fertilization. Weird flex, but okay. How could you not love these tiny adult tadpoles with talon toes and tails? Even I couldn't say that five times fast. Hey there friends, back Mario Facts talk about pelicans. Pelicans are found on many coastlines throughout the world. But did you know that there are actually multiple species of pelicans? Because I didn't. They can live to be 10 to 25 years old. And they're all pretty dang big too. But the Dalmatian pelican is the largest species. They can get to be about 6 feet tall, 30 pounds, and have a wingspan of 11 and a half feet. That means each individual wing is longer than me. But we all know that they eat fish and have a weird neck pouch. I mean, come on, we've all seen Finding Nemo, right? But I gotta tell you, they don't store food in the pouch like a hamster or a squirrel. They can stick their neck through it like this though. Like a much more exaggerated version of their terrifying yet adorable cousins, the shoebill storks. But let me tell you how their feeding actually works. Some pelicans swim together and trap fish in shallow water so it's easy to grab them. Whereas other species go diving for fish and snatch them right out of the water. I got a mouthful of fish just chilling in that neck pouch. Like a death hammock. <laughs> then the bird tilts his head back, the fish slides down, and bam! You got a full belly and a happy pelican pal. But what I find more entertaining is how the babies eat. I can only describe it as going fishing in mother's throat. You just like stick a beak in and yank out some food. But like those beaks aren't small and I often wonder how they don't injure their parents. But I guess they gotta get that scrumptious mom vom somehow. <laughs> Never thought I'd say anything like this, but it is this reason alone I'm glad I didn't grow up as a pelican. Hey there friends, I'm back Marina Facts up with the Greater Roadrunner. We all know this bird from the cartoon, but living in Arizona, I know this bird from my backyard. I see them everywhere. They're not huge, about two feet long from beak to tail. I'm sure you all know this, but they run. They tend to run way more than they fly. The Greater Roadrunner is so fly. How fly is he? Actually not very fly because they prefer to run. <laughs> Max D is probably somewhere around 26 miles per hour so they can easily outrun a human. Unless you're Usain Bolt, but he's a beautiful anomaly so he doesn't count. <laughs> they gotta be fast to catch fast prey. They'll walk around looking for snakes, rodents, and lizards, and when they find one, they dash. Apparently some of these prey items are pretty juicy. Provides the bird with water to help it survive in the hot desert. Occasionally they take to the air to find prey. They'll jump up to grab insects or even small birds. Savage. I'm a savage. Classy. They'll even eat tarantulas and venomous scorpions, which, by the way, venomous scorpions are also all over Arizona. Arizona's wild, bro. They gotta escape their own predators, which include, you guessed it, the coyote. The cartoons, Wiley Coyote always loses, but in reality, coyotes are a lot faster than roadrunners. Oh my gosh, a cartoon wasn't accurate. Who would have thought? I'm sorry, but it also doesn't look anything like a roadrunner. <laughs> they don't say meat, meat. They say wah, 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 wah. <laughs> spot on impression. The species of roadrunner is classified as greater, so even though I'm Team Fish, I'm really not a hater. Hey there friends, I'm back. Mario Facts talk about the Japanese spider crab. It's the combination of the least favorite animal and the favorite food of many people. But I mean, they're pretty perfectly named. This crab can weigh 42 pounds and have a leg span of 12 and a half feet, making it the largest crustacean on the planet. Crab legs for days, somebody melt some butter. These dudes live on the Pacific coast of Japan, hence the name. And they typically live between 164 to 1,640 feet deep where it's nice and super cold. Watch out for their spines. No, not the back kind. I mean, they're invertebrates. Come on. I mean, the pokey kind. They got them above their eyeballs. And to round out their intimidating look, as if 10 six foot long legs wasn't enough, they got some big old keely, aka pinchers at the end of their kilopeds, aka the legs that hold the keely. You know what I'm talking about. What do they do with these keely while they use it to rip up flesh to eat? Chasing prey is hard when you're giant and slow. And I don't blame them. I trip over my own feet and they're normal sized. Instead, they prefer to scavenge like vultures of the deep sea. But what I love most about these guys is that they're design experts. They belong to a group called decorated crabs, which is exactly what it sounds like. They cover themselves with all kinds of goofy things like actual sedentary animals for camouflage. Bro, I don't care how many sponges and anemones you use, it's not gonna be hard to spot a living skyscraper. I don't like spiders and I do like crab, but if I see this guy, I'm calling a cab. He's getting ready for a rap battle. They Hey there, friends, I'm back Mario Fast Club with the Red Panda. First, I gotta mention that these guys are endangered and their populations are decreasing. They're vulnerable to deforestation. I haven't said this in a while, but you know it's always true. Conservation is important. So let's talk about happy stuff. These guys are about two feet long, plus a 12 to 20 inch tail, so they're not huge. They're about the size of a house cat and arguably much cuter. I mean, come on. There's tons of confusion around these fluffy friends, so let's clear it up. So basically, the giant panda is a bear, or the red panda is not. The red panda is the only living member of the family Aeluridae, but Aeluridae is relatively closely related to Procyanidae, which is the family of raccoons. In conclusion, the red panda is more closely related to raccoons than it is to the giant panda, and their common names are confusing. This, my dear friends, is why we use Latin names. <laughs> but anyway, these cute critters live in the mountains of Nepal and China, much like the giant panda. Well, that's not helping the confusion. They spend a lot of their time, including the sleepy times, up in the trees. If they live in the trees, does that make it a tree house? And they're nocturnal, so they like to go looking for snacks at 2 a.m., much like yours truly. To make things confusing yet again with this whole panda debacle, these guys eat bamboo like the big black and white bears. However, the red panda will stray from the bamboo diet to eat fruits and eggs, too. Got sprinkle in a little variety, you know? But let's settle the debate. These guys were called pandas about 48 years before the giant panda was cataloged. That's a OG panda. Hey there friends, I'm back. Mario Facts talk about the cookie cutter shark. I believe that there are two species of cookie cutter shark. The large tooth and the small tooth. I guess it's pretty clear how they were named. These sharks are small and they only get to be about 20 inches long. They used to be called the cigar shark because
but at night they migrate towards the surface to eat like many other deep sea creatures. They eat pieces of large fish like tuna sharks and stingrays. But they also snack on marine mammals like dolphins and seals. And yes, you heard me right, I did say pieces. But they eat these pieces off of wild animals because they're technically a parasite. Hey, I used to be a financial parasite in college. <laughs> they don't actually kill their prey, they just take big chunks out of it. Their giant suction cup lips help them stick to the animal. Then those bottom teeth scoop out a big old chunk. It's almost a perfect circle. Beautiful, really. Very few people have been bitten by a cookie cutter shark. And those that have were most likely swimming at night when they feed. The lesson here is don't go swimming in the ocean at night. The coolest thing about these dudes is that they're bioluminescent. They can actually attract some of their prey this way. Their glowing bellies look like itty bitty fish to snack on. So when a bigger animal comes by to try and take a bite, the cookie cutter bites instead. <laughs> oh, how the turns have tabled. Is that what the kids say? Hey there friends, I'm back with more animal facts. Let's talk about the sandbar shark. For those of you who don't know, I used to work at an aquarium as an intern. So I had the amazing pleasure to work with sandbar sharks and just recently they had four more babies born at the aquarium. But let's get into this. The Latin name for the sandbar shark is Calcarinus plumbius. They do happen to be a smaller shark species at only about eight feet long and 140 pounds. People love them because they're the perfect stereotypical shark shape. Just look at it. These guys are important for US fisheries. They have large fins and palatable meat. But don't freak out because you can have sustainable shark fisheries just like you can have sustainable fisheries for almost any other fish in the ocean. Shout out to Dr. David Schiffman. This is his logo. He has a lot of information about sustainable shark fisheries. Predators of sandbar sharks include larger sharks and humans, duh. But they like to eat smaller things like small bony fish and crustaceans. The largest thing they'll go after is another smaller shark like a bonnet head shark. These friends prefer shallower coastal waters where they stay near the soft bottom and don't come to the surface very often. Also, they are obligate ram ventilators. The only way to get water over their gills is to move, so if they stop moving, they die. Shark says hell. Hey there friends, I'm back. More facts to talk about the colossal squid. I'm really not trying to scare you all with all the deep sea animals, but this one's awesome. This is not only the world's largest squid, but the world's largest invertebrate. You don't even know the meaning of colossal until you know how big this animal is. They can be up to 46 feet long by over a thousand pounds. Keep in mind that it weighs that much and doesn't have bones. But don't be scared because they live in the deep sea waters of Antarctica. If you were to find yourself drifting in Antarctic waters, you'd have other things to worry about anyway. It's hard to believe that something so huge can have predators. But deep diving animals like whales and elephant seals will eat the juveniles. Sperm whales are the only animals known to go after adults, and they've got the scars to show for it. Because this bendy behemoth's not going down without a fight. Now, these dudes eat a bunch of different things. They eat large fish, small fish, one and all fish, and they also eat other squid. Did you know that these guys have the largest eyes of any animal on the planet? Their eyes are larger than those of the biggest whales. They can get to be about the size of a soccer ball. Now imagine seeing that eyeball and realizing that it's attached to something. Ooh, nightmares. And their eyes get so big, most likely to help them see in the darkness where they live. They gotta spot them sperm whales so they can get away. Very few specimens have been caught and it's probably because they're just naturally rare animals. So we don't really know much about them. But what I know is I'm glad they exist because they're super important and cool. I also know that I don't think that I want to encounter one. Good evening, friends. I'm back with more animal facts. Let's talk about the epaulette shark. First, let's discuss why it's called the epaulette shark. It has epaulets. Okay, next. Epaulette sharks are so small and cute. They only get to be like three feet long max. They're super small, but they live to be like 20 to 25. So if I was an epaulette shark, I would be an old man. Epaulette sharks are bottom feeders. So they eat like tiny fish and invertebrates. But do you know where they eat? On land, kind of. They use their little pelvic and pectoral fins to like waddle through this land coral reef area. Ugh. They can handle low oxygen conditions and high heat conditions better than pretty much any other vertebrate, especially any other shark. Can we get a yeehaw for our specialized friends? You can't continue your day until you tell him hello. Hello. All hail the land shark. What should I do next? Hey there friends, but Marine Marino Facts to talk about the cow nose ray. I'm obsessed, look how cute! Into the shape of their nose, which looks a little bit like, you guessed it, a cow nose. I just think that's precious. There are two main types of rays. You got your pancake pals, flap flap friends. The cow nose ray is a standard type of flap flap, and boy do they flap flap. Those wings are just modified pectoral fins that are fused to their head. They literally have no neck. <laughs> they oscillate their fins to move rather than undulating like the pancake pals. Also got these other fins at the front of their face, which a lot of people mistake for their mouths. And yeah, that's me. These little lip-like lobes help them suck food out of shells. That's right, they eat prey like snails, crabs, and oysters. Oh my! They're foragers, and like their sharky cousins, they use electroception to find shelled snackies. I find prey they're gonna break through that shell, so what do they use? Plates! But well, not this kind of plate. <laughs> they got teeth plates. Their teeth are just like bars in their mouth. As opposed to bars outside their mouth, drop a beat! <laughs> well, I got to keep a few ray teeth from my days at the aquarium. Speaking of aquarium days, as you can see, I had a ton of fun with these cow nose rays. They're pretty docile and they kind of remind me of puppies. But they're still wild animals, so please don't touch them unless they're in an aquarium touch pool. I used to feed these little dudes all the time. And they're super smart. They swarmed the back wall when someone with our uniform walked by because they knew it was feeding time. On Animal Facts with Jay, not a cow, but a ray. A flap flap, as some say, and they really make my day. Hey there, friends, I'm back. More animal facts to talk about the hump head brass. 
Yo, this fish got mad drip. Step aside, bird people, your fave could never. While the juveniles are usually white with dark stripies, adult males can be teal or even bluish purple. And they've all got gorgeous patterns. I may be biased because blue, teal, and purple are three of my favorite colors, but they're still objectively gorgeous. These big old boys can be six feet long, over 400 pounds, and live to be up to 30 years old. It's quite impressive. And they live on coral reefs in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. They are sadly endangered due to habitat loss and overexploitation. So remember, as always, conservation is important. These dudes eat a variety of different prey items, like fish, urchins, crustaceans, and other invertebrates. But they're unique in that they can eat toxic animals, like sea hares, boxfish, and the crown of thorns sea star. The crown star has been dethroned. These guys gather in potentially very large groups for mating purposes. A pair will pick each other out of a crowd like a cheesy rom-com. I love a good love story. They mate and then the female releases her eggs in the water and they float away. It's great for dispersal. But did you know that they can also change sex? We don't really know why or when in their lives that this happens. But females do a type of sequential hermaphroditism to turn themselves into males. Like many other fish, these guys can be trained to target feed. The one I worked with at an aquarium was such a diva. She only ate from you if she deemed you worthy. Every day I was like, come on, man, you're krilling me. Hey there friends, I'm back more in fact let's talk about the giant larvations. The giant larvation is a type of free-swimming tunicate. But what is a tunicate? Basically, it's a colorful blob that's surprisingly more closely related to vertebrates than invertebrates. I mean, look at it. I don't know how that's possible, but science don't lie. These things look crazy, and what's even crazier is this is not the animal. This tiny blue tadpole doodad is the animal. The body itself is only about 4 inches long. That may seem small, but other larvations are about 0.04 inches long. So the giant larvation is just giant for a larvation. Which makes sense. The rest of this blob and more is a 3-foot house made of mucus. It's like they sneezed and created a house. The lethal animal must beat its tail to swim around and carry its house around with it everywhere. Hot take, giant larvations are just a species of turtle. Prove me wrong. <laughs> but what is it used for? Believe it or not, they use it for filter feeding of all things. Now, I would not have guessed that, but here's how it works. This large outer layer blocks particles that are too big for the larvation to eat. And the little inside layer, which you can see clear here, funnels the perfect puny particles into the larvation's mouth. That's how the lethal blue friend gets nom noms. <laughs> it doesn't seem like a great system, though. Because when the cute little kitchen gets clogged, they can't clean it, they just abandon the whole thing. I tried to do that with my bedroom back home, and my mom yelled at me. <laughs> Hey there friends, I'm back with Maria and Facts, let's talk about the oar fish. They're also called the ribbon fish, for obvious reasons. It's the world's longest bony fish. The longest ever recorded was 36 feet long. However, reports suggest they can get to be 56 feet long and 600 pounds. Because of this, they're probably the root of a whole bunch of old sea serpent tails. Those stories probably began after people found beached specimens. Because these guys live in deeper, pelagic ecosystems. Even though they're huge, these guys are not a threat to humans. In fact, they eat plankton and krill. Notice how the fins are a reddish orange? They probably gained that color after eating so much reddish-orange krill. Kind of like how flamingos turn pink after eating brine shrimp. We used to think that they rotated their weird pectoral fins like a rowboat oar, hence the name. But now we know that they use their dorsal fin to propel themselves through the water column. You may expect that they swim horizontally. However, they actually tend to swim vertically a lot more often. Don't make no sense to me, but whatever floats your boat and feeds your goat, am I right? If what I've told you so far doesn't make you think that these fish are weird, allow me to mention that they don't have scales, but instead they have a coat of guanine. That's what makes pearls shine. And I wouldn't recommend eating them. Their flesh is super flabby and they taste like gelatinous goo. But he sure is a cute. Hey there friends, I'm back, and we're in fact to talk about the orca whale. Allow me to begin by stating that it's technically not a whale. Instead, it's the world's largest dolphin. They can get to be up to 32 feet long and weigh up to 6 tons. They have a lifespan similar to that of humans as they can live to be up to 80 years old. And though they prefer colder coastal waters, they can be found from polar regions all the way down to the equator. They can swim up to 40 miles a day and dive down to 500 feet deep. Orca whales are super intelligent and social. They live and hunt in pods and communicate using various vocalizations. Each pod even has distinct sounds to be able to identify other pod members. And they use echolocation for communication as well as hunting. They eat mammals, fish, birds, squid, and even sharks. They're the only known natural predators of the great white shark. Dang, they've taken down the big dogs. When hunting together, they use cooperative maneuvers to capture their prey. Not unlike a wolf pack. I'm sure you've all seen that really cool video of orca whales hunting a seal that's stuck on a piece of ice. They all swam under the ice at the same time, creating a giant wave that pushed the seal off the ice. It's snack time, boys. You might think it's sad, but orcas gotta eat too, am I right? Last summer when I was at Friday Harbor Labs, I got to see a whole pot of orcas. Everyone stopped for like 10 minutes just to watch them swim by. So beautiful. Hey there friends, I'm back more in fact, let's talk about Sicilians. It's not a worm, it's not a snake, and it's not a legless lizard. And yes, legless lizards are a thing and they are different from snakes. I once had to take an exam to try to tell the difference between these three types of creatures and let me tell you it was not easy. The Sicilian is a legless amphibian. No leggy, slippery slime dudes. There are a whole bunch of different species of Sicilians, the longest being five feet long and the shortest being three and a half inches long. Wow, such range. And they can be found in Africa, Asia, Mexico, and South America. Again, impressive range. They get their name from a Latin word meaning blind because a lot of them don't have eyes. And if they do have eyes, they're usually very reduced and hidden underneath the skin. But they don't really need eyes because they live underground in soft soils covered in leaf litter. Some even live underwater. And because of this, as you can see, they also don't have ear openings. But they have an organ in their head where their ears would be to help them sense vibration. Small tentacles between their nose and eyes also help with vibration sensing. And yes, I said tentacles. These are actually the only amphibians that have tentacles. These organs and tentacles help the Sicilian find their way around as well as sense predators and prey. And they have dozens of tiny needle teeth to help them catch their prey. Prey like worms, beetles, snakes, frogs, and even other Sicilians. And to protect themselves from predators, some of them have toxic glands in their skin. Danger pasta. I mean, they may look cute initially, but wowza. And this, friends, is why we don't judge a book by its color. 
Hey there friends, I'm back with more animal facts to talk about the Megalodon. The Megalodon is a giant prehistoric shark that lived from 23 million years ago to 2.6 million years ago. And they were chonky. Now we know they're huge, but there's still a debate on exactly how big they got. That's because we don't have any fossils of skeletons because cartilage does not fossilize well. Which is lame. So we have to base these size estimates on the size of their teeth. The name Megalodon literally means big teeth. But somehow I'm still shocked that their teeth could be up to 7.5 inches long. This puts our size estimate around 60 to 80 feet long. I don't care what boat you're in, you're still gonna need a bigger boat. These dudes were at the top of the food chain. Are you really surprised? They ate large marine mammals like whales and dolphins. But I feel like a megalodon eating a dolphin is like a person eating a Snickers bar. It's just a snack. He big chomp. The megalodon lived and hunted in warm waters around the world. In fact, their teeth have been found on every continent except for Antarctica. Which brings us to extinction theories. And before you ask, no, they are not still out there. And yes, I am sure, they're super dead. They may have been killed by the Ice Age. Either the water got too cold for them to survive, or their food sources died out and they starved into extinction. Either way, they went extinct about 2.6 million years ago. And the first humans evolved 2.5 million years ago. Personally, I'm kind of sad that we just missed them, but it's probably for the best. Satisfactory significance. Wow, it was one more time. Wait, I'm dying. <laughs> Make it simple and to the point. There's a purpose to this. No need for. <laughs> Make it simple and to the point. There's a purpose for this. No lead. No lead. I've got no lead! <laughs> <laughs> Dripping so much water. My, <laughs> <laughs> my collar's good, right? Yes. Yeah, you can see my tie. Farewell, one of oh, farewell. 